Alright, today is Monday, March 14th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight. Hey, have you heard about this camel who killed two guys and then smashed a cop car? Well, rumor has it the deceased made a camel toe joke. Anyways, I'm just trying to keep it light here, folks, because we have a dark subject to talk about. So stop bitching and whining already. Grab your diapers, your pacifiers, your coloring books, and let's dive right into it. In focus tonight. What else? The wall of worry. This time we're going to talk about Russia and the cockroaches hiding under the rock. You see, the stock market is taking it on the chin right now, big time, because... On the wall of worry, we have the brothel in D.C., Russia, the thing, China, and lastly, but most importantly, the hawkish Fed. And guess what? We have at least four items right now that are active in the wall of worry. We know about Russia, we know about the hawkish Fed, but now we have news regarding China and Chinese stocks are dropping like a rock in an unbelievable fashion, and it's due to the rise of the thing cases over there. We'll talk about all of that and a lot more in upcoming videos, but in this video I want to keep the conversation concentrated on the Russian item, because we now have a war, just in case you haven't heard about it, between Russia and Ukraine that is impacting the supply chain, and most importantly we have sanctions that are limiting the supply of oil, gas, wheat, and many other commodities. And now we have the tit for tat where we hit Russia with sanctions, severe sanctions, and now they're fighting back and retaliating by imposing restrictions and sanctions on us, some in direct fashion and some indirectly. But make no mistake, the pain is spreading globally. It is not going to be concentrated on Russia alone. As you can see, the inflation rate in Russia is spiking significantly higher, but so is the inflation rate in Eastern European countries, in Hungary, the Czech Republic, in Poland. All of these countries are facing major inflation problem, and this problem is about to get worse. We're talking about a Russian default. At some point, the pain will be too much for the Russian economy, and we will start to see defaults. The problem is, will the damage from these defaults be limited to the Russian economy, or, or will it be contagious across the globe? I think you already know the answer. Just look at commodities prices and look at the stock market performance, not just in this country, but across the Atlantic and Europe. Stocks are crashing all over the place, and now even Chinese stocks are crashing. They've been crashing for a while, but here comes the double whammy. I'll give you more details in this program, and it's going to be shocking. But here's some background for you. We know that Russia is an important supplier of grains, specifically wheat, and hence we're seeing a significant rise in wheat prices across the globe. These are the countries that will be impacted the most. Turkey, Iran, Egypt, Saudi, and the list goes on and on and on. What do you think will happen in these countries when they run out of bread, or the prices of bread get out of whack? I think we have a clue from the past. In the previous episode, when the food commodities index reached these kind of levels back in 2011, we got the Arab Spring, a massive political destabilization across the Middle East. And this time around, perhaps it's not going to be limited to the Middle East. You see, Russia is also a major exporter of fertilizers. Are you seeing fertilizer prices moving significantly higher? This will add more and more and more to the inflation in food prices, not just in this country, not just in Europe, but across the globe. The global share of Russian production in fertilizers is 23% for ammonia, 21% for potash, and then 14% of the urea supply and 12% of the DAP fertilizer supply. But it's not just limited to fertilizers. As you can see, Russia produces about 20% of class 1 nickel in the globe, 19% of gas, 18% of coal, 12% of oil, 4% of copper. So there is and there will be severe damage to the global economy from the disruption of these supplies, be it due to the war or the sanctions. And on top of that, we have Ukraine. Ukraine is one of the top producers of grains across the world combined with Russia. But Ukraine happens to produce more wheat than Russia. Yet the Ukrainian government right now is banning the export of wheat, oats, and other food staples. And the reason is they have a massive refugee problem. They're going to need all the supplies domestically. This will cause massive destabilization across the globe. At least 25% of the grains supply comes out of these two countries combined. On top of that, now we have Moscow retaliating against these sanctions. We have Russia also imposing export bans. 
What are they talking about? Russia sought on Thursday to retaliate against Western sanctions imposed over its invasion of Ukraine by banning exports of certain goods and agricultural commodities. Exporting telecom, medical, auto, agricultural, electrical, and tech equipment, as well as some forestry products, will be banned until the end of 2022. Further measures could include restricting foreign ships from entering. Russian ports and allowing Russian airlines to register jets leased from Western firms as their own property, the government said. We'll talk about that in a second. Hold that thought. But there is another shoe that is dropping right here, specifically for the chip industry, because Ukraine happens to be one of the top producers of neon, which is an important component of chips. Matter of fact, Ukraine produces half the neon supply. Some 45 to 54 percent of the world's semiconductor grade neon, critical for the lasers used to make chips come from two Ukrainian companies, which I cannot pronounce. But you get the point. There is massive disruption of supplies, and you cannot just brush that under the rug and say nothing will happen to the global economy. Nothing will happen to global equities markets. Continue to buy the dip. This is a dangerous assessment because these massive supply disruptions will start to eat away from corporate margins. You add to that the fact that the Fed is tightening and you come up with the conclusion that we have the worst forecast, the worst outlook for the global equities market that perhaps we've ever seen. Continuing, Russia is also punishing individual American firms, in this case Meta, also known as Facebook. I don't do the Meta shit, it's Facebook. And Russia is demanding that the U.S. stops Meta's extremist activities, quote-unquote. Fast forward, Russia banned Facebook and Instagram. What is the big deal here? Here's the big deal. Facebook is stand to lose $2 billion in revenue. After all, what is the point of Instagram if you're not going to use it to creep on those Russian models. Anyways, and of course, I bet that shareholders of Facebook, and by shareholders of Facebook, I mean every retirement account in America. I bet they're all happy to lose 50% of value from the top just to stick it to Putin. Don't worry. Don't complain. I know you're down 50%. I know your 401k is down big, but hey, you're sticking it to Putin. Think about it. And here's the issue about the jets. About half of the $27 billion market for aircraft leased back bonds has some exposure to Russia. Da -da -da -da. According to Citigroup, and more than $700 million of collateral could be out of reach by one estimate. Make that billions of dollars. You know why? Because the Russians are now nationalizing all of these assets. So if you lease the jet to a Russian airliner, well, it now belongs to Russia. You lost everything. Poof, gone. You think this will not cause a lot of pain, financial pain, for all of these companies that lease jets to Russia? Think again. And it gets worse for the airlines industry, folks, because the EU, the US, Canada, Australia banned all Russian jets from flying over their airspace. And of course, Russia retaliated by doing the same. Do yourself a favor, grab a world's map and look at how big Russia is. So now, all of these airliners from other countries have to maneuver around Russia to avoid flying over Russian airspace. And this is adding an extra four hours of flight time for some journeys across the globe. But hey, what is the big deal, right? I mean, you're going to be late a little bit. Your flight is going to take extra time to get to your destination. You're going to be stuck in a tube with other disgusting people, but at least you're sticking it to Putin. Anyways, the detours are costly for airlines. New York-based aviation consultant Robert Mann told ABC News that the extra fuel and labor to operate the longer routes could cost carriers up to 12000 bucks extra per hour. Despite the additional costs, airlines continue to come up with creative routings, even if it means pushing aircraft and pilots to nearly 15 hours of non-stop flight time. This will cause more pain to the airlines industry globally. They already have one whammy with jet fuel prices now. They have the double whammy with all of the rerouting. They have to use more jet fuel, pay extra hours for the staff. You think this is not going to have massive global economic ramifications? Think again. And of course, Russia is now moving to nationalize all of the departed companies be it American or European companies, all of these assets now belong to Russia. And it is a big deal because, take for example Mercedes-Benz, who says the Russian nationalization could threaten $2.2 billion in assets. But hey, hey, at least you're sticking it to Putin, right? And Germany has a high degree of dependency, economically speaking, with Russia. Russia is responsible for 66% of 
all gas imports that Germany uses. What do you think will happen if Putin decides to cut all of these gas supplies to Germany? And it gets even worse. Germany may now need to increase borrowing on top of the 99.7 billion euros already programmed for this year due to the economic uncertainty caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But hey, there is nothing to see here, right? Let's collapse the German economy so long as we're sticking it to Putin. And why are we talking about Germany? Because it's going to be one of the most impacted countries if the Russian economy collapses. Why? They have a lot of ties, economically speaking, with Russia. Among them, and most importantly, Deutsche Bank, the criminal bank out of Germany. Which, by the way, the business model of Deutsche Bank is washing money for oligarchs, Russian mob bosses, terrorists. Yep, and this bank has been troubled for a long time. Perhaps this Russia-Ukraine conflict could be, keyword could, be the nail in the coffin of Douche Bank. Douche Bank says forcing Russia out of SWIFT is dangerous. Don't do it. Why? Here's why. They have billions and billions of dollars tied in the Russian economy. Douche Bank decided not to exit Russia and said it is not practical right now. And then said, but rest assured, our exposure to Russia and Ukraine is limited. If we want to get out of Russia, we can do it right away. But it's not practical right now. And then after a lot of pressure, public pressure, finally Douche Bank came out and said they are in the process of winding down its remaining businesses in Russia. Here's the problem. They will never be able to unwind all of their businesses from Russia. We're talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars. The DAX will crash like you've never seen before. The German economy will collapse like you've never seen before. And if that happens, the entirety of the European economy also collapse like you've never seen before. And it's not just douche bank, by the way. Remember when they said that the Russian sanctions, it's not going to be a big deal to us because our exposure to Russia is limited. We're not a big trading partner with Russia. And I told you, wait till they lift the rock and then we'll see the cockroaches hiding under the rock. And now we know who these cockroaches are. The answer is Wall Street. Whoops. Goldman Sachs said Thursday it was getting out of Russia, the first big U.S. bank to make a move to exit the country after the invasion of Ukraine. You might ask, what is the big deal? Let's stick it to Putin, right? All your horses, we're talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars that could be poof, gone, lost. On top of that, by now you've heard about the nickel story. We have a Hong Kong-based trader that got caught with their pants down shorting nickel. Guess who they borrowed the money from? JP Morgan. And now JP Morgan is entangled in this whole fiasco. But this, this is the big one. BlackRock Fund just lost 17 billion dollars due to the Russian exposure. Uh-oh. And that is just the tip of the iceberg, as Western banks are owed 121 billion dollars by Russian entities. Good luck collecting. BlackRock funds have taken a 17 billion dollars loss as a result of its Russian exposure since Putin's invasion of Ukraine began in late February. It's not the only Western bank or asset manager set to take a sizable hit. Now you know what's going on in the stock market. Now you know why stocks are crashing. This is not going to be limited to Russia, Ukraine. International banks are owed roughly 121 billion dollars by Russia linked entities, according to data from the Bank of International international settlements. And because of the recent decoupling of the West and Russia, clients may not get most of that money back. BlackRock's clients held around $18.2 billion in exposure to Russia-linked assets as of the end of January, the firm revealed. The world's largest asset manager declined to break down its Russian assets for the Financial Times. I wonder why. But its largest Russian exchange-traded fund, the iShares MSCI Russia ETF, so its value plummet from roughly $600 million at the end of 2021 to below $1 million this week. Poof, gone. BlackRock says any client impact would also depend on their initial asset allocation and the timing of their allocation to or away blah 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 blah. In other words, we lost the money. Sorry, whoops. BlackRock is far from alone when it comes to Western asset managers or banks with exposure to Russian assets and businesses. U.S. banks are owed a whopping $14.7 billion by Russian entities as banks across the U.S. are forced to divest from Russian firms amid regulatory 
and licensing restrictions brought about by strict Western sanctions. Russian President Vladimir Putin also gave his country's financial institutions permission to seize assets left behind by Western companies. So all of these billions now belong to Vladimir Putin. But hey, you're sticking it to Putin, right? Among US banks with the largest exposure to Russia is Citigroup. Uh-oh. The bank disclosed last week that it had roughly $10 billion in total exposure to Russia. In a statement on Wednesday, Citi said it was continuing previously announced efforts to exit our consumer banking business in Russia and operating its business in the country on a limited basis, wink wink, otherwise would lose $10 billion. Goldman Sachs said it was also winding down exposure to Russian business this month. The bank had credit exposure of $650 million in Russia as of December 2021, but said losses from the divestiture should be immaterial quote-unquote, and uh, wink, wink, please help us. J.P. Morgan Chase, which has roughly 160 staff in Moscow, also said it was cutting ties to Russian businesses in compliance with the regulatory requirements, noting that its exposure to the country is, or was, limited, quote-unquote. It's not a big deal. Stop selling our stock. The investment management firm PIMCO also held at least $1.5 billion of Russian sovereign debt, plus an additional $1.1 billion in exposure to Russia's credit default swap market before the war. Whoops. Other investment managers with significant Russian debt exposure include Hanos Henderson, Ashmore, and Westrin Assets, according to Morningstar. The French bank, Société Générale, had one of the largest ties to Russian businesses with $21 billion in total exposure as of the end of last year. The dominoes are about to fall, folks. In a March 3rd statement detailing its work to cut its business or Russian ties, excuse me, the bank said that it complies rigorously with legislations in force and diligently, diligently applies all necessary measures to strictly observe international sanctions as soon as they become public. But we hope that you people are going to forget about it and uh, we can do business with Russia again. Otherwise, we lose $21 billion. For the love of God, please, somebody release another variant so we can move on from this Russia-Ukraine thing. Anyways, PNB Paribas is dealing with $3 billion in Russia exposure, while Douche Bank said in a statement last week that it has limited, quote-unquote, dealings with Russia businesses, involving gross loan exposure of $1.5 billion. Credit Suisse detailed $1.7 billion in exposure to Russia-linked entities. The Swiss bank was caught trying to shred evidence of its loans to Russian or oligarchs backed by super yachts and private jets earlier this week. Wow. Folks, this is going to be our Kagos multiplied by a hundred and then some. And by the way, here's your folk hero. You know, the sheep, they always need a hero and an enemy. Otherwise, their lives are not complete. You know, all of these mentally ill people with Twitter accounts right now. They gave them the narrative of the thing. Fauci's the hero. The anti-jabbers are the villain. But now this is getting old and they got exposed lying all over the place. So they need a new story. And the new story is, you got a Ukrainian corrupt politician, Zelensky, as your hero, and your villain is Putin. And this is working for now until it doesn't, and they have to find a new narrative. But regardless, this guy coming out today and saying, Microsoft, SAP, Oracle, all of these companies need to punish Russia more. And I say, you know what? Hold it back, buddy, because you don't get to call the shots in our economy. Sure, we'll help the refugees. We're pressed Severe sanctions against Russia were giving you weapons, but there is a limit what we can do here. We have an inflation problem in this country, and doing more sanctions and more involvement in this conflict will cause an economic collapse of this country, punishing the poor and the middle class the most. And I bet that at some point, all of these firms that are boycotting Russia right now, once their stocks get hit hard and they face the new reality that we have pretty much shot ourselves in the foot because all of these countries are now moving toward China. China is scooping all of that business left out by Western firms in Russia. And you're seeing South American countries, African countries, 
Middle Eastern countries, Saudi, UAE, and then Asian countries, India, all moving toward China, which will be the biggest beneficiary of all of this stupidity in the long run. And then what happens to all of these Western firms when they lose business to Chinese counterparts? Not just in Russia, but across the globe. You think their stocks are going to do fine? And by the way, this guy asked for Israel to intervene and do a peace deal. Negotiations. The Israeli guy told him, take the Russian proposal. End the war right now. He refused. Why? Because we continue to egg him on and his country to continue to fight back so long as they're fighting our boogeyman. We will fight this war to the last Ukrainian. Instead of having peace and ending the war right now, sure, we're not going to trust Russia all the way, but let them walk the walk. Let's see if they're going to walk the walk. But no, we're not going to even try to do that. We want all in until we destroy the global economy, until we crush the poor and the middle class in this country with out whack inflation. And who's to say, by the way, at some point, some uh, accident, quote-unquote, could happen with Russia bombing a Western entity, a Polish entity, and here we go, we have to go to World War III. We just had missile attacks just a few miles from the Polish borders. And soon enough, we're going to say the Russians touch a pubic hair of ours. Ah, now we're going to go to World War III because there are folks, generals, deep staters, Wall Streeters, propagandists all over the place jerking off for this war. They want to see it, they want to live it, but they don't want to fight it, that's for sure. And of course, there is domestic agenda of all of this. It's called censorship. Anything they don't like, they'll call you a Russian propagandist, a puppet, Putin's bitch. And that's how they get to silence free speech. We talk about economic injustice, the Fed, and all the corruption that's going on. Ah, the Maverick of Wall Street is a Russian asset. Can't talk like this. Uh, ban him. Goodbye. And of course, we have the senile leaders, your trusted, beloved politicians, who continue to be in denial of what's going on, the reality of what's going on. Take, for example, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who said, She does not believe China's actions toward Russia are meaningfully undermining the impact of sanctions. Oh, really? All of these Russian firms scooping all of the business we left behind in Russia and paving ways for the Russians to circumvent all of these sanctions? That is not a big deal? You don't believe it, Janet Yellen? She also says, The sanctions over Ukraine war limiting China's ability to buy Russian oil. Oh, really? You want to bet on that? The Chinese are just going to comply and stop buying Russian oil? We already have gas pipelines going between Russia and China as we speak, and that didn't stop. And you bet that the Chinese are buying cheap Russian oil as we speak. What a joke. What a colossal incompetency. Anyhow, folks, we got to move on to cover the market information for you. And we start with the performance of indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closed the day in the green, believe it or not, barely by 1.5 points or a gain of pretty much nothing. The Nasdaq was down big, 262.59 points, or a loss of 2.04%. The S&P 500 down by 31.20 points, or a decline of 0.74%. And here are the sector's performances today. Leading the pack at number one, capturing the gold medal, financials at number two for the silver consumer defensives and we don't have number three or bronze medal because everybody else closed in the red and the decliners were led by energy cyclicals and technology a weird theme today because energy is down along with cyclicals and technology so you have the russia ukraine trade is down but we also have going back to the theme of the year how we started the year. The theme of higher inflation, higher interest rates, and the hawkish Fed, which is good for financials, good for the consumer staples, the dividend paying stocks, but bad for cyclicals and technology because these are the high multiple names that get contracted in multiples in value when interest rates move higher. And this is typical, by the way, as we head to the FOMC meeting, the most important decision the Fed will take since 2008. So you're seeing a lot of profit taking from the energy, materials, the grains trade, palladium is down, gold is down, oil is down, all of these names that popped higher due to the Russia-Ukraine war, we're seeing profit taking in those. We're also seeing more selling in the high multiple names, technology, RKK, etc., as we anticipate a hawkish Fed. If we are anticipating hawkish Fed and higher rates, then financials is the place to go. The problem is this theme could not last for too long. Number one, what we discussed with the Russia-Ukraine front, the war is not over, folks. The financial hit is not over. So the million dollars question is, which theme 
are we going to settle down to? Is it the Russia-Ukraine war theme with weed, palladium, materials, and energy? Or is it the inflationary theme of the hawkish Fed, of defensives, financials, and dividend stocks? Or is it going to be the dovish Fed theme of technology and the high multiple names? All options are on the table. And therefore, I told you before the week even started, I'm going to be a spectator, not a participant this week, at least until the Fed is out of the picture. Moving on, the advanced decline ratio, NYSE 31% advancing versus 65% declining. The NASDAQ, 23% advancing versus 72% declining. We see these exaggerated ratios to the downside. You're going to get a pop at least in the pre-market, the overnight market. But who's to say that's going to last or not in the actual session. Moving on to commodities, futures. Big down day for crude oil. WTI down almost 6.5%. Brent down almost 6%. We're seeing the unwinding of this trade as we head closer to the Fed's decision. But I have a hunch that we're going to go back to this trade. Trade. They're gonna buy the dip in crude one million percent. Likewise, gasoline was down almost five percent, heating oil down almost five percent, and natural gas down a little over one percent. What about softs? The leader is the loser so far this year, OJ. OJ closed the day with gains over two and a quarter percent, and we have cocoa and cotton pretty much in the flat line. Well, we have losses led by lumber, coffee, and sugar. Lumber lost almost four and three quarters of percent today. Metals, big down day, gold down, silver down, platinum down, copper down, palladium down, big, almost 15% to the downside. Look at the charts that we looked at in yesterday's video. The chart is pretty much back at the trend line, the sloping line of resistance now supposedly support. It got a bounce from that line, otherwise we will see lower lows in palladium. My hunch is, after the Fed, of course, depending on what Jerome Powell says, they're going to buy the dip in palladium again. And the same goes for gold. What about meats? We have a big upside day for both live and feeder cattle futures, both scoring gains of over 2% today. On the other hand, the new big tech, lean hogs, pretty much flattish, slightly to the downside, losing a little over half a percentage point today. What about grains? All eyes on wheat. A wheat was up a little over 1% today, so we're seeing a cooling down in the Russia-Ukraine trade, but it will come back. I have a hunch. And by the way, it's not just a hunch. The fundamentals are supporting for higher prices for wheat, palladium, oil, etc., etc. But we also have an upside day for soybean meal, closing the day with gains over one and a quarter percent today. And then we have rough rice closing the day in the green, be it moderately, with gains a little over half a percentage point. Oats was pretty much flat for the day. On the other hand, we have declines led by canola, corn, soybean oil, all losing more than two percent today. And then we have soybeans down modestly. And you might be aware by now that Ukraine happens to be the largest producer of sunflower oil, which happens to be of critical importance, not just for the US, but for countries like China, India. So we have to find an alternative to sunflower oil. Unfortunately, in India, the alternative is palm oil, which is highly destructive to the environment. But we also have rapeseed oil, and the prices of this commodity is shooting to all time highs because it is the closest alternative to sunflower oil. <music> Moving on, the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The hottest stable by far, and a name that took it in the chin big time today, Apple. With about 1 million contracts traded for the name today, about 56% of those were calls. And number two, Tesla, the souffle. Also down big today, and we have around half a million contracts traded for the name today, about 40 six percent of those were calls they're buying puts again the souffle and apple are starting to crash and this is what's needed for the indices to start to crash remember i told you apple and tesla will be the last to fall you can lump nvidia in that mix but once they start to crash run for the hills because the indices will start to crash and we will see the beginning of the economic recession but anyways, at number three, another name. You want to talk about taking it in the chin. This name took it in the chin and got knocked out today. Alibaba, down over 10% today. We'll talk more in the heat map analysis, but about 400,000 contracts traded for the name. About 54% of those were calls. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We start with the ticker T. 
Triple Qs. This is the leverage index for the Qs, meaning it gains three times what the Qs gains and also loses three times what the Qs loses in a day. Not for the year, for the month, some Robin Hood idiots in TikTok before a few years ago when we were amidst the mania, they said you can triple your gains by buying the triple Qs, the T triple Qs, excuse me, wrong, it's only for the day. Anyways, notice the theme here by the way, what are they buying calls on, what are they buying puts on, it's very important. The T triple Qs, in this case they're buying calls, the 42 calls for the expiration date, March 18th, with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 5% by then, and they paid about one buck and 40 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $3.2 million. What about the ticker BIDU Baidu, down big and somebody's betting for more downside to come, by buying the 100 bucks puts for the expiration date March 18th, with the expectations that the name could drop down by more than 8% by then, they paid about four bucks and 20 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending about six and half million dollars. What about AAPL Apple? Notice they're buying calls on the T triple Qs and this time around in Apple but they're shorting Baidu and as you'll see later Baba. But here it is for Apple. They're buying the 160 calls for the expiration date April 22nd with the expectations that Apple could pop higher by more than 6% by then. They paid about three bucks and 20 cents apiece to enter the straight all in all spending about four million dollars. What about the ticker MRNA Moderna rising from the dead? You watch. They're gonna unleash a new one on you. You watch. It's gonna be the fourth booster, the fifth booster, the seven millionth booster. Gotta line up the pockets of Pfizer or Moderna. But anyways, Here's the trade for MRNA, the 175 calls, the expiration date March 18th, with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 16.5% by then, they paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade, all in all paying one million dollars. And the expiration date for this one is Friday, it is a short term trade betting on more short covering to come. And lastly, what about the trade for the ticker BABA -A -A Alibaba? In a world of pain today, but somebody's betting for more pain to come. They're buying the 65 puts for the expiration date April 14th. With the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 16.5% by then. They paid about 4 bucks and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $4 million. So the theme so far is, short China, we have more pain to come for China, but buy the dip in technology, Apple, the Qs, the big technology names. Why? Are they seeing a dovish stance by Powell? Could be. But again, it doesn't matter whether Powell is going to be dovish or, be or excuse me, hawkish. What matters is the market's interpretation of what Powell says at that day. Because the market has a short-term memory and it can forget and unwind everything once it digests the data and what Powell actually said. In a nutshell, I'm just breaking it down for you. The Wall Streeters are going to place their bets before Powell speaks. And the market will move toward that direction either way, whether Powell is hawkish or dovish. I'm just breaking it down for you. The Wall Streeters are going to move the market one way or the other and then then the digestion happens, so you gotta watch for their positioning ahead of time. Anyways, we're moving on to the heat map analysis, and look at this, lining up like a Christmas tree. Red and green all over the place. The red is in technology, the high multiple names, software, chips, the big tech names, Tesla, Amazon, the Chinese names, all getting whacked. Along with some of the recent momentum trades, we're talking about fertilizers, gold, materials, energy all down. What's lining up green? The so-called safety trade, the big farmers, the high dividend industrials, the high dividend consumer staples, Procter & Gamble, Walmart, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, Mondelez, along with the banks as the 10-year pops higher. Now when we dig down for the notable movers, let's talk about the souffle right away because Tesla was down almost 4% today. Right off the gate, Elon Musk admits that not just Tesla but even SpaceX will face significant inflation risks because the prices of these materials are moving higher and higher and higher. And as a result, this is not a surprise to any viewer of this channel, Tesla will probably continue to hike prices higher and higher and higher for the souffles you're gonna buy. That puts them at a competitive disadvantage against the Chinese competitors and the rest because Tesla has no other option. Either they accept reduced margins if that is the case, the growth story of Tesla, poof, gone, down the toilet, which means the stock will also go down the toilet. So the other alternative, at least for now, so long as the consumer remains receptive, is price hikes. But we have more trouble for the souffle, specifically because Reverend Elon is speaking. 
and he is just all over the place. He gave advice of owning physical things like homes and stocks. Last time I checked, stocks are not physical, but anyways. And he says he's not going to sell any Bitcoin or Doge. Um, does he even own Doge? Because he's been pumping Doge. But is he putting his money where his mouth is? Because I know certain family members friends, acquaintances, who bought Doge pretty much at the top because there are a bunch of morons who bought Doge because Elon is going to be on SNL. And that was exactly the top. And they're now down, what is it, 70, 80% from the top? Is this man putting his money where his mouth is? Or is he just a scam artist? Reverend Elon also came out in the morning and said he's challenging Vladimir Putin to a single combat with the prize being Ukraine. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, he also tweeted this, making fun of all of these sheep supporting Ukraine. You know, I support the current thing, the jabs to Ukraine, to who knows what else. And then he tweeted this, and I'm not going to read it for you because I don't want the algos to go crazy, but not kosher with the woke crowd. So what are you doing here, Reverend Elon? Because I can say and tweet all of these things and nobody will care because I'm just a douchebag on YouTube. Nobody cares. But you, you're the richest man in the world. You have an important company, companies, plural, that you're leading right now. You really want to piss off the consumer? Remember what Michael Jordan said, Republicans wear sneakers too. And I say the sheep drive Teslas too, so be careful. Anyways, what about Apple? Apple was down big. We have cases of the thing rising in China, specifically in Shenzhen an important city, an important manufacturing hub, which includes the Foxconn factory that produces iPhones. That had to be shut down, so we now have more supply chain problems for Apple. And where did Foxconn open a factory, by the way? Yep, they're building a new factory, a $9 billion factory in Saudi Arabia. I think Saudi Arabia is a town in Wisconsin, right? Anyways, the Chinese automobile manufacturers Neo, Chingping, Li Auto, all getting crushed today. And there is more pain to come because just like with Tesla and Toyota, GM, Ford, they're all going to face the rise in materials costs. It's inevitable. It is inescapable. The problem for the Chinese auto manufacturers, and I know a lot of you like Neo. When do I buy the dip in Neo? When will Neo recover to all time highs? It is lunacy, but to each his own. The problem for, say, Tesla, Tesla has the pricing power. They can increase prices and the sheep will buy, will continue to buy. But when it comes to the Chinese economy, we're already seeing a weakening. Chinese economy. We have Evergrande, the real estate problem, the recessionary economic indicators in China, to the point where the Chinese central bank is actually easing. So we have an economic problem in China. The consumer purchasing power is being reduced. You're not going to have the same pricing power that you have in the US and European market in China anymore, at least not for now. So this will impact manufacturers, Chinese manufacturers specifically, tremendously. And here it is. Let's talk about it. Alibaba is down big, continues to crash. And I warned you folks back in December 2020. I said Jack Ma knew the risk of pissing the godfather. He took it anyways. Alibaba will probably end up being broken down. Down. I highly recommend against buying the dip here. It was a different issue back then. It started with Alibaba, and then we saw the evolution of the Chinese crackdown against Chinese technology firms. And I told you back then, no Chinese stocks for me. Matter of fact, I told my clients, I'm not going to add any Chinese stocks in your portfolio. If you want that, find another manager. I'm not going to do it because there is a lot of risk in Chinese equities. And guess what? Since then, if you heeded that warning, I saved you a downside of almost 67%. Alibaba, a complete crash. Unbelievable. Yes, it is a value name. Yes, Munger continues to buy, but stay away toxic garbage for now. Not just Alibaba, but all of these Chinese stocks. Look at what happened to Didi. You had Jim Cramer recommending Didi. Well, like Didi, gonna buy with both hands. And now it's down, what, 90% from the top? We also have the ride-sharing companies, Uber and Lyft. We warned you about Uber yesterday, but specifically Lyft. Toxic waste, toxic garbage, avoid. Because the assumption for now that they have the pricing power. But in reality, you're gonna see a portion of the consumers not using Uber or Lyft cutting down on using these rides because the prices are too high. There is an impact and Uber and Lyft will pay a dire price. What about the defense manufacturers? Lockheed, Raytheon, Northrop. They had a better day than the rest, but the Russia-Ukraine theme is being sold for now. Profit-taking. Yet my bet 
is these defense contractors will bounce again. The fundamentals are the strongest in at least two decades since the Iraq war, because we now have a confirmation that Germany will use the F-35 warplanes to replace their old fleet, and these come from Lockheed Martin. We're talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars. So the dips should be bought in these names. Wait for these overbought technicals to be worked out, and then buy the dip in these defense contractors. What about chips? Interesting action in chips, they're down big. And remember, I became bearish in chips at around November 30th when I tweeted this. I think winners in chip stocks are topping. I'm buying puts. We talked about NVIDIA, Xilinx, AMD, Qualcomm, but any chip name would do. And since then, it was pretty much as close as you can get to the top. For example, NVIDIA, since the tweet, is down about 32%. AMD, since the tweet, is down almost 31%. Xilinx is not trading anymore, but Qualcomm, since the tweet, is down a little over 21.5%. The SMH, the Semiconductor ETF, is down over 21% since then. What was the catalyst for calling the top in chips? Most importantly, the rise in the materials and the commodities involved in manufacturing chips. That's number one. Number two, when the Fed starts to tighten, the demand will go down. And they've been manufacturing a lot of chips right now in the pipeline. So at some point, the supply will dwarf the demand. So in the long run, chips are not good. In the short run, however, could we see chips bouncing higher, say when palladium prices go down 15% in a day? Sure, but we're going to have the Fed out of the way. You cannot buy the dip right now in chips with the Fed looming large. They got to go away, whatever Powell's going to say, and then let's see and assess how the market reacts. If palladium continues to go down, if the prices of other materials that go into the manufacturing of semiconductors also go down, then yes, we'll buy some dips in chips. But what about the heat map analysis for the ETFs? Again, what's working? Financials, KRE, XLF, FAS, healthcare, the big pharma names, not biotech. Look at the XBI down over 4% today, while the XLV is higher, the XLP, consumer staples, the XLI, barely industrials, specifically the high dividend names. But besides that, technology down, energy down, materials down, gold down, and what's working is the inverse indices, the SQQs, the SPXQ, and this time around, the VIX proxies, the VXS, the UVXY. We had the pause now they're buying some puts before the feds meeting and by the way the vxx was exploding higher to the point where Barclays suspended sales and the issuance of oil etn and the vxx etn you see traders have been buying and piling in the vxx and oil etfs and these criminals they want the stock market higher so so long as we're buying oil etfs and vix proxies the market is not going to go higher because somebody's betting for higher inflation and higher hedging. So what do they resort to? Banning and suspending trading in these two. You want to talk about market manipulation? Here it is. 99 of the market manipulation happens to the upside. What happens to the free market? Where are the regulators, you might ask? The regulators remain in a coma. What about international markets? We're seeing India, INDA, continues to move higher. We're also seeing European equities moving higher. This is not going to last. I'm betting on it. We also have developing markets, the likes of IEFA, EFA, EFV, all moving higher. And the losers are led by emerging markets, specifically due to Chinese equities. You look at the FXY, MCHI. This is enormous pain in a matter of a couple of days unbelievable exodus from Chinese equities. And this is causing a lot of pain for the emerging markets ETFs, specifically the EEM, down almost 2.5% today. Likewise, Brazil was down, Australia was down, Canada was down, Latin America was down. So you got to be picky here. If you're just buying the EEM as a bet, let's say for emerging markets, maybe you're looking for value over there. Well, you're buying the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the ugly in this case is China. So you got to be picky and specific. Which specific market do you like? Thailand, Korea, Taiwan, Australia, Canada, Brazil. You got to pick as specific as you can. Moving on to charts. And we start with SPY, the S&P 500, 30 minutes chart. Today we had a semi gap and crap. It was a rally right off the gate and the chart recaptured 422 as support. That did not last at all. It lasted maybe an hour or so and then here comes the sell-off. It was a bull trap once again. The SPY closed at the lows of the day. This is bearish, not bullish. And I told you I'm going to wait till 410 and a half and take it from there. 
if we have a bounce, a legitimate bounce, and the Fed is out of the way, then I'm buying. Otherwise, the SPY has to work for me. Show me the money, baby. Close above 430 as support, and then we're talking. But absent of that, I'm waiting for 410 and a half. If that is broken, then it is a shorting signal for more pain to come. Moving on to the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY, the S&P 500. The bulls are still bidding on a higher low and so far we have a higher low formation you lose all of that once 4102 is broken so for now the hope for the bulls remains alive but here's the problem the momentum indicators are curling their way to the downside they remain in negative territory when we talk about the macd the volume spiked higher above average on a down day on the selling side not the buying side all of these are bearish indicators that we have more pain to come and honestly at this point absent of a fed save we're gonna break below 4102 so jerome powell better get to work what about the Q's 30 minutes chart for the Nasdaq? Again, it was a pop higher in the morning and a flush down right away. And we closed at the lows of the day, forming what it appears to be right now a bear flag pattern. Will that play out or not? Well, it might not play right away. And the reason is, look at the RSI, we're getting into oversold territory. I'd like to see 316.46 tested before a bounce, but the Q's might bounce before that. Now the risk is, let's say that we have a bounce in the morning, a gap, due to the oversold conditions on the RSI. Who's to say that that's not going to be a gap and crap? And sooner or later, the chart will go down to 316.46, and therefore, I'm waiting for that line. I'm waiting for the Fed to get out of the way. If we bounce from 316.46 after the Fed, then I'm buying. If we break below that number, then I'm shorting. In the alternative, the chart has to work for me, show me the money once again, and close above 343 as support, and then I'm buying the argument that the chart has already bottomed. And here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the Qs. Whoops. Uh oh. The chart is now trading below 13,300, a critical support lost. It has also broken the trend line in yellow. So we have target number three to look at for, which is around 12,766. Folks, a weekly closing like this below the trend line is absolutely ominous. It is a solid indicator that we have more pain to come, absent of a Fed save. The Fed better push this chart above the line by the end of the week. But again, you look at the momentum indicators, they're curling down. You look at the volume, it moved higher, still below average, but it moved higher on a down day. All of these are signs that the bears are regaining control once again. The bulls get a pop, and it turns out to be a dead cat bounce, a bull trap. This is classic bear market behavior. What about the IWM, the Russell 2000, small caps, 30 minutes chart? Again, a gap in crap. It appeared so far so good in the morning. And then what do you know? A flush down all the way till the end of the day, closing at the lows of the day. Not quite at 191.5, but getting closer there. Now, is the chart going to violate 191.5 right off the door? That could be the case, but look at the RSI. We're getting oversold. Could we see a pop, a gap and crap, and then reach below 191.5? That could be the case. But you got to combine the psychology too. You got to read the psychology. What do we have on Wednesday? We have the FOMC meeting. Is it rational to have expectations of short covering tomorrow? Yes, absolutely. So there is a possibility that this chart could also move higher and recaptures 196.5 before the FOMC meeting. And therefore, continue to say, I remain a spectator so far until we get the Fed out of the way. Here's a chart for the Dixie, a daily chart chart moving toward the highs once again and we're now eyeing 99.9 .9 resistance the momentum remains strong but i have no expectations for the dixie to pop higher or flush down before the fed's meeting the dixie is waiting and waiting and waiting for the fed's announcement if jerome Powell comes out hawkish indicating that he will follow the footsteps of paul volker then the dollar will pop higher significantly higher but if he leaves the door open for perhaps a retracement of some of these hikes or maybe keep an open mind that perhaps the Fed will not commit to six, seven, five, whatever it is, rate hikes. The Fed will be data dependent, quote unquote. Then the dollar will flush down and we will see equities blasting higher. What about gold, the daily chart? Working out all of these overbought conditions on the RSI, the MACD indicators, and the critical support is around 1,000. 925 you go below that and then we have a problem but if there is a bounce then buying the dip should be the move in the chart of gold because we have a pile of shit ahead of us not just the russia ukraine but the hawkish fed 
the recession, all of these are good indicators for gold. Moving on to the 10 year yield, what a move. A rocket ship higher, and it could go significantly higher. The resistance I'm looking at right now is around 2.44. We'll talk when we get there, but for now, it is an impulsive move higher. It is pricing in that the Fed will be indeed hawkish. The Fed will commit to increasing interest rates multiple times this, this year, and this is all good for the 10 year yield to continue to move higher. But usually, not always, market psychology will works in reverse, meaning you pop the 10-year higher, in this case the 10-year yield, ahead of the Fed rate hike decision. And then what happens after that? The opposite move. We see a pullback. And if that happens, it will be down to the support of 1.94. Will that happen? Sure. That is the classic market psychology. Do you bet on it? Is it going to be written on stone? Of course not. Because for all you know, the bond market could interpret Powell's speech as hawkish and anticipate more rate hikes to come. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And this chart will continue to move higher. What about the TLT weekly chart? Oh... What a lot of pain for the TLT bugs. A gap down, but listen to this. This is a weekly chart. You're not going to leave that gap open. So if I'm reading the tea leaves right, we have a gap down right now. But after the Fed, after Powell speaks, this gap could be closed. We could see the TLT back at 134 and a half. I'm just reading the tea leaves for you. But following the technicals, look at the RSI, the MACD, the pattern formation. The bet for now is the TLT going down to retag the support at around 128. What about the VIX 4 hours chart? Look at the MACD indicator. It is curling its way higher again. So is that all there is? Is this the dip in the VIX? Is it done now? Is the VIX about to pop higher again? The answer to that question would have been easier had the VIX closed above 33 for the day. But for now, that keeps all possibilities on the table because we could see a pop higher tomorrow in the VIX. But we see it trading above 33. The MACD crosses producing green impressions in the histogram. Then comes Powell with a dovish talk and we see the VIX curling its way down again. So for now, it is a no man's land, but clearly market bears have the advantage. And in this case, VIX bulls have the advantage. What about the VXN? the VIX for the NASDAQ. We look at the MACD indicator, we're still showing red impressions on the histogram, but it is about to cross producing green impressions on the histogram, indicating another pop coming for the VIX. In this case, the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ. What does that mean? It means more downside for the NASDAQ. If we have a pop, we're looking at 40, as resistance number one, and then we're looking at 44 as resistance number two. The pattern of higher highs remains intact. But again, how do you guarantee the VXN will continue to go higher after the Fed's day? If the Fed comes out dovish, this chart will go down, no doubt about it. The NASDAQ will pop higher. This is at least the assumption of the options market bets. So for now, this chart favors the NASDAQ bears. This chart favors the VXN bulls. But if you're reading the tea leaves correctly, you look at the options market. Why are they buying calls on the T-triple-Qs? Why are they buying calls on Apple? You use your head. We have a Fed meeting coming. The Fed will certainly be as accommodative as they can. And the market might like that. And we see a lot of short covering. And we see the NASDAQ popping higher and the VXN dropping down. What about Apple? Here it is. The big kahuna, a daily chart. It went down all the way to 150 as support. It is not a good pattern, folks. It looks like a reverse hammer. The volume is spiking higher on the selling side. The MACD, the RSI, both in negative divergence. All indicators say that this chart is toxic garbage right now. And by the way, it crossed and closed below the 200 days moving average. So the bears, the NASDAQ bears, will argue we don't care about Jerome Powell. Look at this chart, the most important technology stock in the market entirely. And it is forming a really bearish formation below the 200 days moving average. The momentum is accelerating to the downside. It is about to cross below the lower edge of the channel, the lower range of a channel that goes back for at least two years. Do you really think that Jerome Powell can save this market when Apple is about to crash? This is at least the argument from the bears. And here's the monthly chart for Apple, by the way. Tick tock. Fed save or no Fed save, this chart is about to crash. Look at the RSI with the negative divergence for the first time in at least two years. Look at the MACD indicator crossing to produce red impressions for the first time in two years. And it's coming off from a really elevated reading on the MACD, meaning we will see a crash if this plays out. If it does, using Fibonacci levels, we can go down from this point by 20%.
percent. So you haven't seen the end of the pain in Apple and the Nasdaq and the entirety of the stock market. The Fed better save the stock market. I don't know how, but they better do it. This is at least what the bulls are thinking about. Here's another name, an important one, Tesla, the souffle and hourly chart. If Apple and Tesla go down, goodbye. The party's over for good. Tesla gapped down in the morning and then it worked its way higher. Tesla whale was buying a lot of calls, but today Tesla whale got a massive, nice, warm pie right in the f face. And we saw flush down a sell off right away and Tesla closed at the lows of the day. The moment you try to close a gap and you fail and the chart starts to reverse, that is an indicator to start shorting. And now, the only hope for Tesla whale and the pumpers is the fact that the RSI is oversold from an hourly perspective. Let's say the oversold technicals play out. Tesla will pop higher in an attempt to retest the sloping line of resistance, as you can see in yellow. But here's the problem. A monthly chart of Tesla. We looked at Apple. Apple is crossing, showing a red impression in the MACD indicator with negative divergences in both the RSI and the MACD, indicating that the top is here. For Tesla, the indicators say the top is already here. We already got the top. We got the confirmation. What does that mean to you if Apple and Tesla start to go down? This is the end of this market, baby. Anyhow, here's BTC, tulips, Bitcoin. What's going on? Nothing is going on in purgatory between the support of 35,750 and the resistance at around 42,000. We're not doing anything right now until the chart crosses above 42,000 and above the triple top. Absent of that, a crossing below 35,750 will initiate a short trade all the way to 33. Thousand. Lastly, what about AMC? Whoops. A gap down, an attempt to close the gap at around 14.24, a critical support, now resistance, and that attempt was met with failure. Yes, AMC is oversold from an hourly perspective, just like we saw with Tesla's chart. So could we see a bounce again? Yes. And the resistance will be 14.24. If the chart get rejected again, that will be a solid shorting signal, and this chart will go down all the way to 10, and there is more pain to come. Moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic? calendar tomorrow. We have the producer price index, the PPI. This is an important indicator because it is a leading indicator for the CPI, the consumer price index. And the assumption here is we're going to see massive increase in prices for producers. The most important element for the market is if this is a hot reading, the PPI, then how will that impact Jerome Powell's statement because the decision is already taken. We know that the Fed will increase interest rates by 25 basis points. But will the reading of the PPI impact Jerome Powell one way or the other when he speaks? We'll see. We also have the Empire State Manufacturing Index, another important indicator for inflation. And with that, folks, I'm done here. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.